forgot to change the time on my laptop, so I'm like, oh, starting a little late. All right, uh, welcome. Uh, you probably noticed me standing up here doing a bunch of technical crap because I my ship breaks things, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we're going to roll with this. It wasn't even the original laptop I had a plan on using today, but uh, we'll see what happens. So um, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a talk about malware breach response, uh, to be kind of generic about it. So um, the art of post-infection response and mitigation, what the hell happened to my network? Hopefully you haven't been confronted with that question, and if you have, hopefully you knew the answer, uh, because if you didn't, it doesn't look very good on you as security professionals, which I assume you are since you're sitting here right now, or at least you want to be security professionals. Um, so moving on, who the hell am I? Uh, my name's Caleb. Some people call me chill. Uh, some people tell me to chill, but it just happens to be when you catch me. Uh, like last night, one in the morning, it was a tell me to chill kind of uh, interaction. I'm a malware analyst at Silence. Um, we're actually hiring, if you've ever heard of Silence, uh, so look us up. Uh, I am the founder of the CarolinaCon shootout. If anyone doesn't go to CarolinaCon and lives this close to North Carolina, shame on you. Um, CarolinaCon's been going on for about the last 11 years. Uh, it happens in Raleigh, North Carolina every March. And, uh, well, I figured out these hacker people like to shoot guns, and I do too. So uh, check us out, hackers.withguns.com. Uh, we have it every year. This will be our seventh year coming up. And, uh, yeah, we just like to shoot guns, barbecue, and go to the hacker cons. So uh, I'm a dirty white hat, uh, which is funny because I've never presented in North, uh, West Virginia before. And my dirty white hat happens to be a West Virginia hat. Go Mountaineers. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Go Mountaineers. <laughs> um, oh, before I continue, shout out to Adrian. Adrian Crenshaw, Iron Geek. Keep doing what you're doing, man. No matter what. Doesn't matter who, what anyone says. Um, also, uh, I'm your Huckleberry. So uh, if anyone's ever worked at a startup, you know you have to be a Swiss Army knife always. Uh, so I got so used to saying, well, favorite thing from my favorite movie, uh, just put it on my Skype profile. Uh, also, if you come to my shootout, we'll see if I'm your Huckleberry or not. Um, but yeah, also, silence is hiring, by the way. <laughs> so a little overview of what we're going to go over today. Uh, we're just going to look at the gray area, which is uh, post-infection. Basically, what happens from the time the machine is infected to the time it's not infected. It's kind of a gray area, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about malware breach responses, or lack thereof, a uh, ba little battle planning, and uh, dumb tools. So I'm going to go over a few tools that I actively use to this day and have used for years. Um, there's more to the tools than I'm going to show you today, but hopefully you go and explore afterwards. Um, so first, into the gray. Uh, can anyone tell me why post-infection is kind of a gray area? Anyone? Nope. Uh, well, I've outlined some generic reasons. So um, post-infection is a gray area because, well, hey, Jacob in HR gets infected. What does he do? Well, he calls IT. Does your IT department have someone that actually responds to breaches? Maybe, maybe not. Malware breaches specifically? Maybe not. Um, so the first uh, reason why post-infection is such a gray area is the most obvious one. It's because people over rely on antivirus to hell and back. Uh, we have AV, we're good, you know, sweet, you know, carry on with work. Nah, it's, it's, not, it's not antivirus anymore, for one, okay? There's two companies out there that say AV is dead. My company, not to, not to plug silence. The other company is Symantec. Uh, what does Symantec still do? <laughs> they still make antivirus. They put that article out like five years ago. AV is dead. It is. Um, it shouldn't be called antivirus anymore, actually. All it is is really a breach alerting system for you, for your network. It's going to let you know when you're screwed. It's not going to let you know before you're screwed, and if you have your bin console set up correctly, which you may or may not have, it may tell you you're screwed and you ignore it. Um, but it's basically there to tell you you're screwed, which is why the anti part doesn't really work anymore. We call it antivirus. It's not. We should just call it literally virus or virus alert. Dot org. Uh, I'm going to register that real quick. So uh, the second real reason is malware persistence techniques. Um, 
As far as the techniques go for persisting on a machine, there's a wide variety. I'm going to cover the extremes right now, though. Crypto locker, malware persistence technique. Extremely stealthy targeted attacks against your organization, malware persistence. So these are at different ends of the spectrum for very good reasons. One is in your face. It doesn't care that you see it. You're not going to do anything about it. You're maybe going to try to decrypt it or pay the ransom or whatever. But it's persisting in your face. It's, they should call it middle finger wear, actually. Um, the other portion of the spectrum is basically like targeted attacks. Why would they want you to know they're on your network? They're not going to let you know they're on your network unless, A, they're sloppy coders, B, they're wonky as script kitties or something like that. Uh, no offense to anyone here, but it, it's, it's not going to pop up with a fake antivirus if it's a targeted attack. It's going to persist on your network. It's going to exfiltrate in a trickle fashion. Or if they do something like, well, I won't talk about any of the recent dumps. Um, anyways, they're going to persist, and the way they persist prevents you from even knowing they're there, or if they are there, doing anything about them. Uh, but the third reason is the most important one, and it's why I'm here today. Um, this mouse will work. So lack of exposure and training. How many people in this room have actually handled like a, a malware sample? Like, you've had it on a flash drive, or it's been on your hard drive. You don't just delete it. You actually do something with it. You run it on a VM, or you've actually even just had a malware sample that you're like, wow, that's a malware sample. I'm going to move that to the malware folder. Um, not a whole lot of people experience that because of you don't know what to do with it first. Your AV is detecting it or not detecting it. And, you know, you may not know it was there. Or you did, and you kept dragging the damn window to the corner of the screen using A-Ways. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, there are three kind of generic malware breach responses I'm going to go over. Um, one of them obviously infuriates the shit out of me, which is why I've described it as such. Uh, the first one's Nuke and Pave. Uh, Nuke and Pave is probably what a lot of people here are most familiar with because it might be your company policy. Just format that thing, get it back to work. You know, reimage that box, boom, malware problem gone. What have you done? You've actually eliminated evidence for the malware author. Thank you. Um, so, nuke and pave, WTF, FFF, FFF, um, and uh, the proper response, which you can actually see how I feel about them by the corresponding memes. So, um, <laughs> nuke and pave, right? You reimage it, it's quick recovery, get back to work. You know, Jake and HR keeps getting malware, but, you know, he keeps getting back to work because we keep formatting his machine so much that you may even have him on your ghost clone server or something because he gets so much malware. Uh, so if you're going to do this, and it may be your company policy, I realize it, just there are several different fashions of lazy admin kung fu. This is just one of them. If you're going to re-image the machine, the word image, think about that. If you're going to image the machine, get an image of it before you re-image it. Um, what you basically have with this image is you have an organic infection. It may have, be, it may have been targeted for your organization. Um, you have this pristine image where the person got infected the way they were actually supposed to get infected. It was, I mean, if you've ever actually tried to detonate malware in any type of lab environment, it's frustrating because it, you have to do so much shit to get this stuff to detonate sometimes. Having this pristine box that just got infected the way it was supposed to, beautiful. If you don't know anything about malware, guess what? Now you have a training tool. You not only have a training tool, you have something to look at to say, oh, you know, this is a finance image. Maybe I should dig a little deeper and see what it was actually going after. Anything like that. Um, so the second one, and don't be these people. And if you know these people, find keyboards and bats and beat them with them. Um, WTF. And I used to lead a malware response team, and that's where this frustration comes from. Um, the breach occurs, denial ensues, and guess what? Nothing. Um, they deny that they're infected. And when I talk about dragging the box to the corner of the screen and keep using the computer, it's actually kind of a common practice, uh, unfortunately. I've been on bank networks, uh, doctor's offices, large and small, just police networks, which I won't name them individually because, well, police. Um, <laughs> I've been on these networks and it's like, it, they've been ignoring it for months. And it finally gets to the point where 
the annoyance threshold is reached critical and they're just annoyed. They're not concerned about anything, but man, that sucks. I gotta move this thing. I gotta reboot in safe mode to use this program. Like what the hell's going on here? Don't be these people. The reaction when someone tells me, oh, they have a malware infection. Oh, you know, we've been battling this thing for a little bit. Well, I ask, how long has this been going on? Oh, like three months. Like, what? Some of this shit I can't even wrap my head around. Really? Like, you're a law office, or, you know, you're a psychiatry practice. Three months you've been ignoring this? Like, how much data has been exfiltrated? How compromised are you? This is the point where they should actually just move into your office with you because they've been there for months. Uh, so don't be these people, and if you find these people, take care of them, please. Uh, we need less of these people, or train them, uh, but I, I prefer the, the latter. Um, <clears throat> so removal and analysis is, in my opinion, and hopefully everyone's opinion, the way you should actually approach this every single time. Um, even if there's no analyst on the end you're going to be passing information to, you're sitting here for a reason. Do your due diligence. Go find this stuff. Uh, the first thing you should probably do is obtain some memory dumps. And uh, if anyone's familiar with volatility, you can do this very, very easily. So there's a, there's a situation I've come across where you have an office in Seattle and your headquarters is in Florida and there's some huge infection. How am I going to transfer an 8 gig memory dump? Because let's be honest, most machines have like 4 to 8 gigs in a work environment nowadays. It's a huge memory dump. And there may only be a little bit of legitimate information in that memory dump. What are you going to do? Transfer it over TeamViewer? Even like transferring over the corporate VPN, it's like IT is going to be calling you up like, you know that's 8 gigs, right? What is, what's going on here? Um, and on top of it, if that machine's still on the network to some degree where you can actually transfer that, you're in trouble anyways. How can you overcome that? You can get individual process memory dumps, which I'll go over here in a little bit. Um, it may amount to nothing, but you've done some diligence. Like you've actually got something that may actually give you a little bit of information. Something is better than nothing. Especially if you're actually going to hand it off to someone who uh, actually is going to do the response. Uh, this stuff's golden. Uh, they know where to look. They actually can do a lot with this stuff. It just depends on whether you get it or not. Um, not everyone thinks about this portion of it. So before you even touch the machine, get on the network and get a PCAP. 30 to 60 minutes more if you really have a week to spend on looking at PCAP data, but 30, 60 minutes will basically tell you if data is being exfiltrated, what kind of communications it's making. And before you even touch the machine, you can evaluate what the hell is going on with it just by the connections it's making. Not only that, you can use something like Foremost or Bro, and you can actually carve the files. Was that what you were going to ask? Well, you were asking, did you say you plugged into the network and then run, the, run like a TCP dump on it? So in forensic response specifically, and this is any digital forensic response. Don't pull the plug. If you pull the plug, you set up a red flag to someone, especially if it's a multi-node infection and they're monitoring your network. Oh, gee, one machine went down. Exactly. So, I mean, and that's not even the, the course of this talk. This is, that's forensic investigation. That's digital forensics. Don't unplug the machine. That's the first rule. Probably not getting yeah, I mean, they're you're now their cloud storage at that point. <laughs> uh, so get a packet capture because it's it's good data. Like you foremost, bro, carve files out of it. Look at how it's interacting. Um, even if you don't do anything with it, just have a repository of pcaps that have like crazy data in them to play with later. Uh, MalwareTrafficAnalysis.net, check it out. Um, so manual malware extraction. Find it. Go look for it. Um, if a program wasn't running right on your Windows box, what would you do? You'd probably go try to diagnose it somehow, at least a little bit. So when a malware person gets on a machine, a malware uh, response person. <laughs> uh, so when a malware, response, malware responder gets on a machine, there's always like these little lists we have. And sometimes you write them down. Sometimes there's so much information you don't write it down. The first thing is a list of locations I look immediately. Um, I go into the recycle bin folders, like the actual back directories. I look in there. You know, program data, look in there. 
the app data folder. It, it, such a great little maze to hide malware in. Uh, folders like called Adobe that have Microsoft inside of them or something like that. You look for these things and you actually, your mindset starts to attach itself to this algorithm of looking for malware on the box. But if the more you find, the more locations you know, and the more you know how the malware looks in that specific directory or something like that. If you go into app data roaming and there's a uh, DLL with, um, this is all lowercase randomized letters, it's probably bad. Um, but it may have a word icon. I've actually done a test where uh, Trend Micro is remoted into a VM and I've actually watched them do the removal. And I literally went to a malware domain list and just got like 40 payloads and just detonate him. I didn't even know what they did. I just wanted to see this guy work. He passed up this icon. It was like random letters and numbers .exe and it had a word icon. And I swear this guy passed it up like 18 times. Uh, they were just running their remote, like the, they have a software tool that they run to kind of automate their analysis or their removals. But I literally watched him like remove all the other malware files around it and just leave it because it had a word icon. And you could tell he wasn't used to looking at malware. He was used to looking at the tool he was using over and over and over again. Um, so this part's very important. Have sandboxing in your environment to some degree. I mean, you can pay for sandbox stuff. You can get it for free, Cuckoo, anything like that. But just have it. Do yourself a favor. Even if you're not like a security person at work or you don't even have one, have this. And here's why it's important. So. I'm a malware analyst, you give me a sample, and you really need deep dive data done on it, it's not gonna take me an hour, it's gonna take me a while. Um, sandboxes by no means replace malware analysts, ever. Don't ever think that. Um, it's always some type of little ghost in the machine that doesn't make the analysis come out right sometimes, but if you need data fast, and you've set up your sandbox environment correctly, you're gonna have data back fast. So. How do you set up a correct sandbox environment other than going and look at what your grandmother has installed on her computer, uh, which will probably detonate most any malware? Um, go to your HR department, audit. Do a little audit. Go to finance, do a little audit. See what software the individual departments are actually running. Make those your sandbox images. I mean, have one for IT, have one for support, have one for HR, have one for finance. Kind of get an average of what software they're using and when finance gets hit with a targeted attack, you know, PDF attack or something like that, and someone actually detonated the attack because you're running semantic or something, um, you'll actually be able to grab that sample, throw it at that individual sandbox. I mean, you could even have like, I mean, no one runs x86 anymore, but you could actually have different architectures as well. But you have that image, boom. Is it looking for QuickBooks? You know, is it looking for this or that? You have those answers immediately. It's generic, but it works. I mean, you have a response immediately. You can start looking throughout your network for these uh, individual characteristics that you know came back in the sandbox report while your incident response team or your analyst is actually looking at this stuff. Um, so it's actually very important. People are, sandboxing is a term that's so generic nowadays, it's like saying APT, and if I had a drink, I'd drink right now for saying that, but um, it's a thing. It's just most people just, uh, too many marketing departments have picked up this word as a problem. So it's a thing still, it's a good thing. You just have to do it right. So, uh, battle planning. <laughs> if you have one sentence that says, if we get hit with malware, call our AV company, you've actually done a lot more than a lot of other companies have done. And I'm not talking about companies that have their own SOC or have their own response teams or even a company that has enough uh, revenue to, you know, contract out a response team from someone like Silence. Um, <clears throat> but you should have at least some something written down somewhere. Um, you should provide training to your people or whoever you have working for you. Literally, if it's a local IT shop, look some stuff up and quiz them a little bit on malware. What do they do? Local IT shops, oh, they're $90 malware removals. What do they do? They reinstall Windows. Um, but just have a plan in place. Have some stuff written down, send out an email, you know, receipt it, whatever. Just have some sentences in place to say, if this happens, we're doing this. Or if this happens, we're doing this, this, and this. 
as uh, we move on, multiple response solutions. You know, this looks like oh, notepads hitting on every single machine in the entire network. What the hell are we going to do? I think that's a false positive. Do we have a plan in place for that? No. Um, I mean, that's an obvious false positive. If it's something like SQL Server 2008 or something, but it's hitting on every single box, might be a false positive. Um, but just don't upload it to VirusTotal. <laughs> um, single node responses, network breach responses. One sentence will do. If this happens, we do this. Um, so SharePoint's kind of for, the, for that kind of terminology. So multiple defense methods. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, everyone should have appliances and all. Uh, maybe if your appliances are failing you, contact ThreatBot. Uh, ThreatBot actually will probably get you going a little better than some of the major appliance vendors. Um, and audit your damn network. Like I was saying, how are you going to know the attack surface if you don't know the attack surface? I mean, if you don't know your own network and you're getting breached by malware left and right, something's wrong. Take five minutes. They all eat lunch, except the IT people. They all eat lunch. They're all going to be up from their desk at some point. Audit them, um, please. And whoever has like Java Runtime Environment 5.0 installed is either a sandbox <laughs> or someone that you should really pay more attention to. Uh, I've seen up to 12 Javas installed like on someone's machine. How much do you need? I mean, Java's not the biggest vector anymore, but it's freaking dangerous. Um, a lot of websites you like probably require Java in some way, shape, or form. Uh, recently, I've seen attacks spawning from websites where basically uh, a Java file loads inside an HTML file, and it starts scanning your network. There's JavaScript built in that starts literally port scanning your network. Um, yeah, so by all means, install Java. Uh, good luck. But don't have it installed if you don't need it. How many of you actually need to have Flash installed on your machines, on your network, at work? Right? Right? But how much pro productivity would go down if you removed it from the whole network? Um, if Jimmy can't watch, you know, Red Zone highlights while he's doing his sequel, like, he may not work as fast. Uh, so you actually have a weird problem there with productivity and Flash, which HTML5 uh, hopefully is going to be replacing because Adobe likes to make patches for a living. Um, but yeah, don't install Java unless you need it. Don't install Flash unless you really, really need it. And by all means, try to run Linux. <laughs> Wine can get infected, by the way. I've infected Wine with worms before. And uh, you want to talk about weaponizing uh, something that shouldn't be weaponized in a very major way? Infect Wine sometime. <laughs> You're basically giving Wine an, a Linux exoskeleton to screw people with. Uh, it's pretty funny. So. Uh, now we're going to go over some tools, and two of these tools I use a lot. One of these tools I use even more than that, but there's a catch, and I'll get on to that soon. So Process Explorer, if you haven't ever used this, go download it right now and use it. Um, it's what Task Manager always should have been. Uh, literally, I mean, look at that. It's beautiful. You can see the execution tree. If you open this up immediately, you can see injection occurring. You can see... Uh, explore.exe, like running iExplore or running some kind of like service, uh, running some executable or service that it shouldn't be spawning. Like you can literally look and see, oh, explore.exe, it's using 700k. That's normal. You open up something like, uh, there's, you can go into the properties tab and you can look at the TCP IP activity. Oh, why is it connecting to like 200 different random IPs and host names? Oh, well, welcome to the botnet. Um, so, and I'm going to shout and move away for a moment. As you can see here, uh, you can actually go to the individual processes and create individual process dumps. And that's kind of where I was getting earlier. Uh, you can do that for everything on here. Um, Process Explorer is so versatile and awesome that in one of the options, it literally says, oh, replace task manager. Thank you. Yes, it does. It will. Even as a transparency mode, that's how awesome it is. Um, it's kind of weak because it's not Linux, but it's transparency mode. They tried. Um, so something else really neat you can do with this, you can see what's hooked into what, uh, what handles, everything. So in this case, I did a search for the at symbol. And you know, as you can see, it pulled up 
the uh, the Ghostry add-on I had loaded in my browser at the time. Uh, but the reason I looked for this at symbol is because when uh, there was a virus called uh, Zero Access Cyrofef that came out six, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, one of the files that dropped was an at symbol, and it dropped it in this weird, obscure directory, and we were having some trouble finding it initially when it first came out. We were looking for unique characteristics. The other two files that dropped were like the letter N and the letter U. I'm not going to search the whole machine for that, especially the internals of it. So we were like, oh, let's look for the handles this at symbol has. And I wish I actually had that screenshot. It was literally hooked into everything. Uh, Explorer, services, SMSS, CSRSS, everything. It was just hooked into everything. And we found out that if we eliminated that portion of it um, through various little anti-malware tricks, we could actually stop it from re-executing when the machine rebooted and actually the files we were getting off the machine wouldn't come back immediately after that. Um, but yeah, you can search the whole internal of the machine just with this little search box. Um, also, the properties for the, um, for the processes, this is very important. A, you can actually submit the hash to virus total through this properties box. And keep in mind, you can replace task manager with this in Windows, which I highly advise doing. Um, it does send the hash to virus total, and you get the hits back, but it's only sent the hash, and this is very important. Does anyone here use virus total ever? Yeah. Do you know Google owns them? <laughs> uh, virus total is handy dandy, but it is a uh, malware farm for Google, basically. It's information they monetize because you upload it. That's great. That's why they have a little section where you can search for hashes instead of uploading the file. Why would you upload a file to Google that you, it could be a targeted attack PDF or something with your company name and information in it. It could be a legit PDF from your company that they've just injected a bunch of crap into and all of a sudden it's on virus total. They're monetizing that and I, I personally know if I get a hold of that PDF and I start reading it and I see your, like your company information, I'm probably gonna call you or something, but that's embarrassing. Always, always, always only upload, only check the hash on VirusTotal. Um, domain names, IPs, that's fine, but hashes only. You don't wanna, Google has enough money, stop giving them more. Um, but as you can see here, oops, I'm hoping I didn't screw anything up. Uh, you can look at the TCP IP properties, you can look at the strings, and the strings is very important as well. Um, Strings aren't dead. Strings are used a lot in malware analysis, especially static analysis. In this box, you can actually look at the static strings and you can look at the memory strings. So basically, once a program is actually executed, the strings may change in the memory, uh, which is very helpful sometimes when you're looking at a crypto locker sample. Um, when it starts enumerating uh, network shares and stuff to keep encrypting, you can actually see the shares it's enumerating in the memory strings. Uh, I forget what variant of crypto wall that was, but it's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> not funny for that particular tenant, <laughs> but it was pretty funny. Um, so yeah, you can do a lot. You can see the execution path. You can even verify the process with Microsoft. So if it's explore.exe and it's actually not, you can try to verify it and it'll tell you whether it's verified or not. Um, literally, this is task manager on steroids. You can just see everything. So, dump some memory. By all means, dump it, dump it, dump it. And why not use a tool called dump it? Uh, especially because it's called dump it. So, this is a very harsh tool. It just does what it does. It dumps the memory. It'll give you like a generic timestamp. Um, obviously, uh, I'm a sublime fan, but uh, it'll give you a generic timestamp. It'll just dump a dot raw file or dot raw raw file out. And the .raw file you can access with volatility, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's lightweight. It runs on pretty much any version of Windows. It just dumps memory. It's called dump it. So the third tool I'd like to talk about is uh, it's kind of a conundrum. Um, so when 64-bit started getting big, Dell was already selling 64-bit machines to people who didn't know what 64-bit was or no one wrote 64-bit anything yet. Um, we were coming across a lot of stuff that was, you know, deep into the system. It was literally some of the malware listens for you to run something like Process Explorer or any type of anti-malware standalone utility. It'll listen. It'll shut it down. It'll remove the execution flags. 
literally, you'll open it, the box will open, it shuts itself down, and it removes all the executable uh, privileges on it. In some cases, it actually removes like all privileges, like it only lets it run via system or something like that. Uh, very devious. So we're coming across these a lot. We're like, crap, we actually figured out how to undo it, how to stop the malware from doing it while we were fighting it on the machine. But the 60, if you run a rootkit utility that's made for x86 on a 64-bit box, you're probably going to blue screen it really quickly. It's just the architecture is so different. If you write one tool in x86, it's going to be completely different if you're going that deep on a 64-bit machine. And that was the problem we were having. All the utilities we were using, we could actually go remove the callback that it was making um, <laughs> in real time on x86 machines. So all the 64-bit machines we were coming across, we were screwed. So I like to go researching late at night, preferably. Um, no Red Bull, usually beer. But I found this tool, and it's awesome. This tool is sweet. So this tool is called PC Hunter now. It used to be called, correct me, because everyone does, Zooter, Zweeter, whatever. I call it XT for short, because PC Hunter sounds kind of generic. So some things you should know about this tool right off the bat. Um, it wasn't coded in the United States. Uh, this was coded in, I'm pretty sure, like Shanghai, China. Um, <laughs> this utility is freaking awesome, though. Uh, it was coded in China, though. Literally, if you go to the website where you download this, and it, literally, it's just that download directory is just an index listing of files that you download. If you go to the main site, I'm sure there's really good information on it, but it's all in Mandarin, completely in Mandarin. Um, whoever made this actually probably went against this country's like national pride by providing this tool to remove really sophisticated malware. I have no idea. There's even an executable that has like a FireEye attachment on it. Um, that you can actually submit files through this tool, your FireEye box, which I, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but um, it's crazy. Not only that, if you look in the title bar, it actually self-obfuscates every time you run it. Um, so like I was saying, a lot of malware looks for like tools like Process Explorer, they have static attributes that it looks for and shuts them down. This self-obfuscates every single time. I'm not sure if it's because Mandarin or it's because he actually programmed it like that. My suspicion is a little both. But it even drops its own config file and driver, as a matter of fact, so the driver can not get infected previous to you running this program. Um, this tool's freaking awesome. I mean, you can look directly into ring zero, ring three. You can look directly into the kernel. Like, You can look dangerously deep into the system. You can do some real damage to the active system with this, as a matter of fact. Uh, but what we found was it runs great on 64-bit boxes. <laughs> um, so we were actually able to overcome these rootkits that were stopping us from using these tools, we'd run one tool and just eliminate what it was listening for, and we'd run the rest and remove the malware and mitigate the process. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's really, really sweet. Uh, if you're in a hurry, it actually has this examination section, and every single tab is represented here. You can literally just hit go, and it prints out, and it, every tab has like four or five sub-tabs as well. Um, I think I have a copy on this VM, so I'll open it for you. But literally, there's so much data, you'd probably fall asleep reading it. Um, but it's quick. You can get a report, and you can move on if you need to. So like I said, uh, this is coded in China. This is hosted on a website in China. Um, guess what it does when you run it? <laughs> it calls out to China. <laughs> um, so this tool, when you run it, it makes uh, three to five callouts, depending on what version you're using, and it connects to Chinese IPs immediately. Um, it's it's legitimate, but I don't trust it anyways, because why would you? I mean, I don't care if it's connecting to, like, legit domain.cn. No way. Like, it, I'm, I'm just going to stop it right there, because I don't know what it's doing, right? But this is why you should approach every single tool you find as a piece of malware. So that's kind of what I was getting to. Um, if you find a new tool, yeah, this is sweet. You know, before my entire team started using this, I approached it like malware. I was throwing it through my sandbox environment. I was trying to pull it apart. By the way, this particular one, 64-bit in Mandarin, good luck. <laughs> uh, I was actually trying to crack it because there's a pro version. Good luck. Um, it, it's going to be two weeks out of your life that uh, 
you'll see nothing but Mandarin and 64-bit shell code. Uh, so it's a great tool, but it, it calls out. Uh, so when I found that out, I didn't say, look, guys, you can't use this tool. I said, this tool is freaking sweet. We're going to use it, but we're going to find a way to use it without every single customer machine we run this on, like having these calls. The I mean, if they're doing like egress filtering, it's probably going to hit their perimeter somewhere and they're going to be like, what the hell's going on? What are you running on, on our network? Um, so all I did was, you know, I fired up like TCP view or I fired up Wireshark and I just ran it. Uh, even some of my sandbox software re uh, re gave me back the PCAPs for what it was doing. How do I get around that? Well, I use a malware trick that I use to fight malware to use this tool. I just go to the host file and I null out all those IPs. So there were like four or five, I just made a batch file that before they ran the tool, it would just go to the Windows host file and it would just null those IPs to local host. Boom. And it was really searching, like this is legitimate. Since it changed names, I think whoever made this is actually trying to monetize it because there is an SDK. Uh, there's a 64-bit version, 32-bit version, version that talks to FireEye, and the older version available in that downloads directory. But, you know, it's a great tool. Why why not use it, but research it first? Um, yeah. So, some other tools you should really, really look into uh, if you haven't yet. Uh, everyone here knows Kali, obviously. Volatility, you should check it out. Please get into volatility. If you're going to be dumping some memory, Without volatility, there is recall framework, but volatility is, I mean, it's, it's king malware, uh, or king memory forensics framework. <clears throat> Sys internals, I just gave you a taste of Sys internals today. I mean, there's uh, 30, 40 different utilities in that whole suite. Uh, auto runs, a, another good Sys internals utility. Auto runs, you can actually snapshot the machine and all the critical reg keys and stuff and do a comparative snapshot with them. I could go on and on about sys internals all day. The best thing is get it, start playing with them. Uh, the guy that created sys internals actually did a really good video on the newest sys internals I'd recommend watching on YouTube, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's funny because he seems like he hates Windows, which <laughs> makes me smile. Um, yeah. 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 And actually, I'm glad you brought that point up because I usually bring that point up. Sys internals, sweet. You know, Process Explorer, awesome utility. Microsoft didn't make it. They got so mad they bought it. So that's what happened. But then that, that's also why you'll notice his commentary about Windows when he's talking about it. It's pretty funny. So Jemer, uh, Jemer is kind of an obscure little tool. Uh, does anyone here use like TDSS Killer from Kaspersky? Really, really good rootkit removal tool. Uh, they actually bought the technology off Jemer. Uh, Jemer is still a utility, 64-bit, 32-bit. It's rootkit, um, rootkit detection, kind of removal. Uh, Jemer actually has a really good file browsing utility. If you ever come across like malware that has compromised like Explorer or like keeps crashing it or something, you start up something like uh, PC Hunter or like Jemer, they have built-in file browser that doesn't use Explorer, uh, which actually enables you to go into directories that you're not supposed to go into. Like the... Um, any directory in Windows 7 that's like one of those transitional shortcut directories, when you click on them in Windows, you can't get into them, even uh, in command prompt sometimes. With this, you just click straight into them because um, it has a built-in file browser that doesn't give a shit about Windows. So Cuckoo, Sandbox. Um, there's a lot of commercial sandboxes out there. Cuckoo's free, and it's a Cuckoo. Um, Wireshark, if, if you have no other... Uh, reason to install Wireshark, the icon's a shark. Get it on your desktop. It just looks neat. But yeah, Wireshark's an awesome utility. I'd recommend studying up on it. Uh, there's a ton of filters. You can filter so finely in Wireshark that uh, it makes it all worth it after staring at all those entries flying by you for so long. Um, and some bootable utilities. Uh, I'm going to go way out of order on these just because. Uh, so Hiren's Boot CD, does anyone know about Hiren's? Please, yeah, Hires is sweet. Uh, it's pseudo illegal probably because the Windows XP portion, but that's the sweet part actually. Uh, Hires Boot CD is like 500 and some megabytes. Uh, I actually created, you can cut, it's fully customizable. So they want you to customize the disk. And I actually took it a step further than it even uh, went like they want you to. 
I got it down to about 112 megs and made it a response ISO that I could actually send to other offices and say, burn that and boot it up. Uh, I actually had it, so it would actually boot into Windows XP automatically. I, my company at the time owned TeamViewer, by the way. So it would actually auto-initiate the networking on the XP image. Uh, I made the background like instructions on what to do. So as soon as they booted up, they would see. And I put like TeamViewer on the desktop. Literally, we could get into boxes that were hammered by like the first versions of CryptoLocker, which it didn't actually encrypt the whole system. It just put a screen up that you couldn't get past, right? We were losing left and right, so I made this image, and we could actually, all of a sudden, we were mo uh, mounting the re registry highs remotely and stuff like that, and it was very, very nice. Uh, the, the Linux portion of it is parted Linux. Um, it's mainly for uh, you know partitioning and stuff like that. It's Linux, so it's hella useful any way you put it. But uh, check it out, Hiram's Boot CD. There's sketchy copies of Norton Ghost on there, but you know, you'll see. Uh, Def. So Deft and kind of Helix go together. Uh, I was talking about little like digital forensics earlier. These are two distributions you would really want to play with if you're actually going to be playing with digital forensics, like looking at uh, hard drives, like hardcore. So Helix is nice. Helix is kind of the industry standard a lot of people use already. Deft, I actually had to find because there was a missing driver set or Up. I'll talk forever on these things, especially system internals, which it, there's so many freaking tools. A lot of them actually get classified by other AV vendors as hack tools. Because system internals is a really good hacking toolkit as well. I mean, you can do a lot of PSEXE, for instance. I mean, you can spawn remote processes on boxes, basically, because they built this utility that does it. Um, so, yeah, system internals all the way. Anyways, um, that's it. Uh, Uh, so, yeah, uh, auto runs a process explorer. You can actually modify the columns, the out, like the columns you see on the screen when you run them, to actually automatically do verification. 
So when you start up Process Explorer and all the uh, entries start scrolling down, like you can actually VT column, it'll, it'll actually go check every single hash, although you're only allowed to do 25 a minute uh, with virus total public, so it'll do 25 of them. Um, but yeah, th there's so many columns and so many options you can add, uh, just check it out. But yeah, to your point, it, it'll, it might say unable to verify, it might have a feature where it kind of fails over to local, um, but I, I'd probably just do some kind of like get the file and maybe run it or do a signature verification or something. Um, anything else? Cool. Uh, well, thank you. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, my tweets are borderline sketchy sometimes. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I tend to be an open book. And uh, silence is hiring, by the way. <laughs> thank you very much.